So I am Annalise smith Inkley. Welcome to Maria and Mary Ann, um, or Mary Ann, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing. Um, I am Annalise smith Inkley. I am the president of the Berkeley Student Cooperative Alumni Association. Um, we're a charitable nonprofit and a CAA alumni chapter. And we are the host for this panel that you've found yourselves in, um, housing accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, we are the Alumni Association of the Student Co-ops, um, and our mission is to support them uh, in, uh, you know, providing affordable housing um, for UC Berkeley students and local community college students to help uh, lower the barrier to higher education. Uh, accessibility is an incredibly important aspect of housing, but also, um, unfortunately, one that does not get the attention that it should. Um, so understanding accessibility and its uh, challenges and meeting and mitigating those um, is one of our organization's priorities. Um, so we're, you know, happy to offer this panel as, um, you know, a way to share a bit of that complex story and to try and bring that conversation more to the forefront. So um, a couple quick housekeeping items. Um, one, you've been muted upon entry, um, which is intentional, and we do want to hear from you, but please save any questions for the end. Um, or you can put them in the chat and we will compile them um, to read out loud for the end as well. We will share some screens, our uh, slides and video, um, but in the meantime, it's just going to be speaker view. So if you want to focus on the person speaking as opposed to all of us, um, however lovely we are, you can change your Zoom view uh, in the upper right hand corner of your screen um, and you can change it to speaker instead of gallery. Um, lastly, this video is being recorded. You would have received that message, um, but if you aren't comfortable sharing your face, that's okay. And you can just turn your video off. Um, so thank you again. And um, I'm gonna introduce our moderator, Marcella Murphy, who's here. Um, she is one of our BSCAA board members and also a student co-op alum, lived in a stunning six houses over nine years. So really got to intake all of the BSC culture as far as I can tell. Um, she's done a lot of work with us on our board, um, everything from working on events and um, welcoming new members via personalized emails, helping distribute nonpartisan legislation for California elections. Um, and insofar as disability is concerned, uh, she put very eloquently that um, it's more a way of life in being responsive and aware of the people um, that she's with and making that a regular part of life. So with that, Marcella, thank you, and I'll leave it to you. Well, thank you. I'm really pleased to put on this program because um, when I arrived in Berkeley in 1969, it was a very, very difficult place for a disabled person to be. Um, if you were very mobility disabled, you had to live in the hospital. The hospital environment was a hospital environment. You could not really live like a student in the hospital. Things just began to open up at about that time. And um, I am excited to hear how much things have changed in the last 50 years. Um, so we're going to begin with um, finding out how, how people find housing in the Berkeley community from Alana. Hi, I'm Alana Terrio. I lived in Rochdale, 1990, 91. And I guess it was 91, anyway, it's a long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. And then I moved into Castro for the last two years of my stay. And what was exciting about that was I got, I was the first wheelchair user who was able to live in one of the houses as opposed to the apartment. And I really fought for that and had, had the experience of educating the board and house members about how, how well it can actually work. And it's very inspiring that the co-op has always been adaptable. And, and excited to include people. So that's been a great experience. Um, the community, that's what you're, I'm sorry, Marcella. Your question is at this point. Um, what is the current state of options? Oh, I'm sorry, you're, 
That's my allergies. You're talking about the BSC. I'm sorry, yeah. I got confused. You're presenting for the BSC. Yes. Yeah. Um, the BSC, like I said, has been incredibly innovative in, since my involvement in the 90s. Um, I actually was on the board when Josh Mealy was the, the chair of the board. And so it was very exciting for me as a disabled person, seeing another person with a significant disability. For those who don't know, Josh is blind. And he actually chaired our raucous, obnoxious, very long mm-hmm. meeting into the night um, with some minor ad- adaptations, his own, where he used a device, a braille device that, um, braille and speak, I think it was called back then, where he was able to keep track of the agenda and speakers list and um, questions list and have an assistant who was not just a note taker, but who to just give him verbal cues about what's going on in the room. Like mm-hmm. someone was raising their hand and then he could berate them about whether or not it was a question or a statement. Um, <laughs> and if it was rhetorical, he'd give them a bad time. So. Um, I got to watch that and and actually being one of the only visibly disabled people in the room was less intimidating at that time than being one of the very few women in the room. And that was actually harder. So I was dealing with both of those issues of how do I argue without my voice cracking or feeling like I'm being a bad girl. I was dealing with all that social stuff as well as being a person with a disability, which was actually easier because one of the beauties of moving into Berkeley when you're young, I moved to Berkeley when I was 16, and I was a little older in the co-op than most of my peers. I was in my early 20s at the time, while most people were moving in at age 18 or 19, and I was probably about 20, 23. So I was a little older. I was pretty comfortable in my disability experience. But the, but you know, most people with disabilities are not just one identity. So we all come in with all the baggage that comes with the intersectionalness of our lives. People of color were largely not represented at that time. Um, queer people were getting a pretty good foothold in the early '90s, and that's the thing I've seen most develop in the last decade in the co-ops, which impresses me. But the co-op has really embraced the intersectionality of people with disabilities in the way that no other organization I've been involved with has ever done. And that's saying something. I um, started working at the Center for Independent Living in 1988 before I was um, in the co-ops, I also taught disability education in the public schools district, disability cultural education. I represented disability needs when I worked at a rape crisis center um, on the peninsula. Um, I worked at the World Institute on Disability on an internship. I worked with a lot of organizations that are either interested in accommodating people with disabilities or they were fully integrating I mean, they were fully involved in disability services. That was their mission. And the co-op has done it best. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's been a real insight. Okay, I want to get to Alex, who is going to give us the perspective from what's available in the community at large, adjacent, especially adjacent to campus. Alex? Yeah, um, absolutely. So should I hear... um, Gosh, I'll, I'll share uh, the presentation I kind of put together here right now. Um, let me see. There's PowerPoint. All right, so uh, let me get this in presentation mode. Um, that's my face. Uh, um, I personally am not non-dorm, non-BSC housing in Berkeley, uh, but um, that's what this little presentation is about. So um, yeah, I uh, lived in the co-ops as well. Uh, I have to give a huge shout out to Alana because um, I moved into Wolf House um, the summer after my freshman year, um, and that was one of the accessible houses. And then uh, 
rolling into my sophomore year, I moved into Castro House um, and actually stayed there for six years um, because I uh, stayed through my master's at Cal. Um, and uh, another thing, you know, speaking here about um, the uh, housing options in the city of Berkeley after I graduated and, you know, a few years later is kind of when I hopped into it, but I was the uh, city of Berkeley uh, Commission on Disability Chair. Um, uh, I've since moved to Oakland and I'll talk a little bit about why. Um, but I kind of want to hop in here and just talk about what makes housing accessible um, because uh, folks might not quite uh, fully understand that. Some key features, um, and this would be for uh, a wheelchair accessible, but also different other uh, types of disabilities and, you know, moderate mobility disabilities uh, that don't involve a wheelchair, but you've got uh, stair-free entrances and homes, uh, elevators in multi-story buildings are really key. Uh, wide and easy to open doors. So uh, uh, ideally with say a low spring weight and the kind of handle where it's got a lever instead of a knob. Uh, good floor plans that a wheelchair could navigate through easily. Uh, low enough counters, um, accessible restrooms. And this is kind of with a, an asterisk um, uh, in that accessible restrooms could be wheelchair accessible, uh, but you can add on say a roll-in shower, which is something that uh, all of the accessible co-op houses have. And then diverse housing options for different people, you know, uh, whether you want um, uh, to live in a larger apartment building or maybe a single family home. Ideal features here would be automatic door openers. And this is the entrance to an apartment building as well as uh, say individual units. Um, if that apartment building uh, has elevators, uh, multiple elevators are good because if one goes down, you're kind of screwed going back and forth to your apartment. Um, uh, good uh, heating and air conditioning, and this is especially with climate change, um, and the fact that, say, a HEPA filter that is in a good HVAC system will also be good for wildfire smoke, and a lot of people with disabilities have, uh, you know, uh, uh, respiratory concerns around that. Uh, located near goods and services, I love to be able to ride my wheelchair down and be able to shop and uh, get services as needed. Near transit corridors, again, People with disabilities have lower levels of car ownership um, than the able-bodied population and uh, transit is really key for this community. Um, affordable, now this could be a full building as affordable housing or say having a set aside. And then um, other additions could be smart home features for people with disabilities that are able uh, to you know, operate their home with their cell phone. Um, and that could be, say, a, a smart front door lock to let in a caregiver um, if you have a backup caregiver or don't want to give them a key. Um, now, something here to keep in mind is that if you look at the levels of accessibility, um, it really depends on the type of housing. Uh, so here's something from the American Housing Survey looking at the Oakland uh, Metropolitan Statistical Area. Um, which is, you know, it includes Berkeley. It's really, it's a, about a million homes um, when they did this. And you can see that potentially modifiable is uh, just under 30%. Livable for someone with a moderate mobility disability is just under 3%. And fully wheelchair accessible um, is 0.09%. I mean, this is an incredibly low amount of fully wheelchair accessible housing. Um, renter occupied housing is going to be more wheelchair accessible than owner occupied housing um, and uh, more expensive housing here above median rent uh, is 0.13% accessible whereas below median rent is 0.04% accessible. Um, uh, single unit homes uh, are also less accessible than uh, 50 plus unit buildings. So some of these larger apartment complexes that you'll see. Um, and another key thing on these 50 plus unit buildings, there's a lot of potentially modifiable units there. Uh, well over 40% of uh, units in larger buildings could be modified. And a lot of these larger buildings were constructed after the ADA. Um, and then getting down to this last kind of line, buildings that were built before 1940, um, are really, really not accessible. And over there, 0% wheelchair accessible as of a decade ago. Uh, built 2000 or later, you've got higher rates of modifiable, 
much higher rates of livable. You know, this is 1.28% for old housing versus uh, almost 9%, and then 0.83% wheelchair accessible. And something that's key about that is it's related to uh, when housing was constructed. Um, and these little square boxes, so these are decades. Uh, the uh, left hand is pre-1940, and then uh, it kind of goes all the way through the 2010s. Um, in Berkeley, 9.3% uh, of our uh, housing units were built after the Americans with Disabilities Act passed. Um, and 47% was built before 1940. Uh, so you can see that's going to create a huge shortage of accessible housing in the city of Berkeley, uh, which is a shame. This is the home of the modern disability rights movement. A lot of it started um, at Cal. Alameda County is better, 20%. California is 25.9%. Uh, so really, our city is behind the eight ball in terms of the accessibility of housing. It's, it is unfortunate, again. Um, and there's something to, to, to think about here is a lot of members of the disability community, um, and rightfully so because of concerns about, you know, capitalism and what it's done for our community, and then also um, uh, ex new housing being more expensive and seem seeming kind of exclusive away from people with disabilities. Uh, the reality is that this is going to be a more accessible building. Um, than an old one. You've got here that this one has an automatic door opener already installed. Um, it is over 50 units, right? It's brand new. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's, we kind of need these new buildings. The key is to make sure that there's enough affordable units to meet the needs of students and then also, you know, graduates and other members of the disability community um, that are low uh, to moderate income. Now, finally, uh, getting here is uh, for accessibility rules for apartments in the city of Berkeley. This is where uh, I think students, it would really behoove students to uh, be active members of pushing for more uh, accessibility. Um, in housing in the city of Berkeley. So what we have is for new, this is for new construction uh, is kind of what I'm talking about um, because those are gonna be the more accessible uh, buildings and then uh, that's what's gonna be built into the future, right? Uh, is it has the ADA basics around wide doors and hallways, uh, taller buildings will have elevators. Um, bathrooms, um, actually there's no rule that a certain percentage of units in new buildings need to have roll-in showers. There is a rule that the tub needs to be big enough that you can tear it out and put in a roll-in shower, um, but that costs money and sometimes, you know, the tenant can be made to pay for that. Um, the, the, the landlord does not have to pay for that kind of a modification. Um, the ele there's an elevator ordinance in the city of Berkeley, um, which is that if the elevator goes down in your home, uh, then you have 10 days. Uh, uh, the landlord must pay for a hotel for 10 days, um, but then they don't have to keep on paying for a hotel. Uh, the, the elevator can stay down as long as possible and there's not really a recourse. That's absolutely something that needs to be revised. Um, and I invite members of the community to work on that as well. Um, and then finally, what we have is accessibility modifications and reversions, which is tenants can shoulder, shoulder the cost. I mentioned the bathroom remodel. Actually, if you move out, they can make you tear that shower out and put a tub back in. I mean, this is... Some people with disabilities, they'll have a special need or uh, um, a, uh, a trust fund, say. Say they had an accident, they got a settlement, or, um, you know, their parents were able to put away money that they could use for something like this. But a lot of members of our community, you know, you can't just shell out uh, thousands and thousands of dollars to modify a rental apartment. Um, and so what we need here is automatic door openers in certainly entrances to buildings. That's not already required. It's simply that you have to have a low spring weight, right? Um, we need to have accessible unit set-asides. Um, and uh, say 15% of units could have a fully accessible restroom, door opener on the apartment, uh, a blinking doorbell for individuals who are uh, deaf and hard of hearing. Um, uh, I'm a huge proponent of there being multiple elevators um, and an improved revised elevator ordinance, um, clarifying costs and providing financial support as needed 
for modifications. Um, and then finally is more housing. Um, and the issue here is that, you know, the, the housing market is a market. There's something to be said for supply and demand and market rate supports affordable housing. And when a building is 10 years old, it's going to be a little bit, you know, within people's pocketbooks if you keep having new buildings coming up. Like the, the existence of homes is a cycle um, that kind of uh, happens over decades. So that's what we have. Um, uh, it's unfortunate because the combination of the housing shortage in Berkeley, as well as kind of the funky bit around how leases work, where leases are often aimed towards students, where you have something like uh, uh, options for a four month, a five month, a six month lease, uh, as opposed to in other towns, non-college towns, it's almost always a 12 or an 18 month uh, lease that you need to sign up for. And when landlords have that higher turnover, um, then they bump up rents a little bit uh, to, to try to take care of that. And then they're, they're able to because students don't have as many options. Um, there are more housing um, developments going up uh, aimed towards students. Um, and I think that's great. Um, uh, but again, uh, the more the merrier and there needs to be uh, more input provided to make housing even more accessible going forward. Um, and this is another opportunity for activism, uh, for students, uh, for networking with alumni, um, and really pushing the city to do this because again, this is the home of the modern disability rights movement and uh, Berkeley deserves it. So that's kind of what I got here. I really appreciate all the, yeah. all the statistics, especially. I know that's a lot of work to get those numbers up. I did want to add one note about what laws are relevant to these accessibility features. Um, okay, we, we can have this discussion after, but there's one more part of the opening presentation first, and then we'll get into this, because I really want to give this the time it deserves, too. Okay. Um, so the next, the next presentation is housing in, housing provided by the University of California at, at the UC campus. Hello and welcome. This is the segment panel for UC Berkeley Housing. My name is Lily Quintero Paul. I am the housing disability specialist. A little bit about me before we get started in here is that I have been working for DSP since the very start of 2019. And when I first came to Cal, I was hired on as the academic disability specialist. And so I was able to support our team with determining academic accommodations for students, both undergraduate students and graduate students. I did that for about a year and a half. And then I had the opportunity to transition into the housing disability specialist role. Uh, my role is the first in Cal Housing and DSP, but not the first within the UC system. The, that role um, is currently being occupied by my colleague at UC Davis. And so we like to collaborate and see what um, our different schools are doing in terms of housing accommodations. And prior to coming to Cal altogether, I have been in the special education field in Los Angeles for six and a half years. And I would say that's where a lot of my foundation comes in with special education law and um, the IDEA, which is the law that over um, protects students with disabilities in the K-12 system. So for the first question, what is the current state of housing for people with disabilities in the community? Uh, when I'm answering this question, I'm specifically speaking to the community of Cal. And so just to give you some information about raw data, we have about 9,181 students residing within Cal Housing residences. Um, in the Disabled Students Program, we have a little over 4,000 students enrolled. That doesn't mean that we have 4,000 students uh, requesting housing accommodations as well, but just to give you an idea of what those numbers look like. Within our DSP program, um, and of those 4,000 students, approximately half or 2,000 students 
have mental health disabilities ranging from depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, um, and more. In terms of housing accommodations specifically, uh, for this, this fall 2021 housing cycle, we did have 616 housing accommodation requests. Not all of those requests um, came from students who had supporting documentation for their for their housing accommodation request. It was just uh, the official form um, that came in. And at any point throughout the school year, students are entitled and are encouraged to request housing accommodations if needed. We understand that with disability natures, some of that can initiate any time. You know, even if students do have a permanent disability that's stable, um, there could be exacerbations, changes, flares, medication um, that all impacts the students within housing. And so I would say in terms of numbers that um, that's where we're at within Cal Housing. All right. Now we need to... Uh... Now we can have more discussion. Okay, we're. Um... Yeah, what was Alana going to say? I, I was curious if we don't mind. Okay, well, one of the things that people want to know is what do we do? What can we do to make these situations better? And, yeah. and part of what I do, I, I do a lot of things. I'm a, my specialty is public benefits but because I've been doing independent living services, I get asked about everything. And housing is a very confusing thing. People are familiar with the concept of the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's a pretty new law, relatively speaking. 1990 was when it was passed. And it really doesn't have jurisdiction over housing. It does over housing construction, but not so much over tenants rights. Um, that the Fair Housing Act is where most of these accessibility requirements are enforced and landlords not being allowed to discriminate against people with disabilities is covered under the Fair Housing Act and not the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I think it's really important that you understand to some degree what both of those laws do. And when you're working with students, when you're working with people trying to find housing or negotiating with landlords or even being a housing, I mean, the, the co-op's a landlord thing, you know, yeah. basically, and the co-op is covered by both the ADA and the Fair Housing Act. And if one of our students wants to make modifications to one of our houses, that is a, a Fair Housing Act issue as opposed to an ADA issue. Now, California has some of the most liberal building code requirements that go beyond what the ADA and the Fair Housing Act require, and that's Title 22. I'm sorry, Title 24. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been around a lot longer than both of these, both of these pieces of legislation. So it's good to look at to, when you're looking for information to advocate for yourself or for someone else, you dive into the Fair Housing Act first when you're looking at building codes for the Title 24. Mm -hmm. Alex, did, did you have more to add to that? Um, I, uh, I'll give a quick anecdote because I think it's, it's, it's important for us to consider. I was um, also sitting on the community advisory group for a couple of new housing developments uh, um, on uh, current BART parking lots. Uh, so the one at North Berkeley and then also the one at Ashby. Um, and there were um, some homeowners in North Berkeley that didn't want their view of Mount Tam blocked uh, by too tall of a building. Um, and they, their, their argument is we don't need housing for students because, look, students are going and moving into Oakland where, you know, in the, in the MacArthur Commons and these high rises, they have plenty of money to do that. And I did a little bit of just some browsing on apartments.com. And for the same price in, for, uh, um, um, for the same monthly rent in Berkeley versus Oakland, uh, you get about 50% more square feet in your apartment in Oakland, in a brand new building 
um, in, in, you know, the, the same number of bedrooms and the rest of it. Um, so people are moving to MacArthur Commons not because they have money, uh, you know, a whole bunch of money to spend on this, but because they're priced out of the town. Um, and uh, it's especially unfortunate because uh, Berkeley has some amazing disability-related resources. Um, you know, at the Ed Roberts campus, um, there's also Easy Does It, uh, which is a backup personal attendance service um, that, uh, uh, you know, again, a lot of uh, people in Berkeley uh, fought for. Um, so we're pricing potentially students with disabilities out of the footprint of services that they need. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, MacArthur Commons is on the bus line for the six, right? And you get your little free AC transit pass. Um, so, st well, I'm not sure if it's still free. I might be um, aging myself a little bit here. Uh, but um, that, you know, you can get to school, you have to commute, and you lose services. Um, and I think that as a community, uh, it would really behoove everybody to um, uh, you know, focus on rents and especially for students um, in these situations. So, yeah. And go ahead, block as many views of Mount Tam as you want. I think that's totally fine. <laughs> yes. Um, one question that I had is, as you start to get toward graduation, what happens to you if you need to stay in the vicinity of Berkeley for a while? Are you able to transition out of the housing that is directed at students into something if, if like you can't live in the co-op or you can't live in the dorm and you were there, what, what kind of transitions are there? I'm so glad you asked that. I mean, in the last 30 years of looking at independent living skills, training services, resources for transitions. I've seen a lot of change. And one of the biggest changes is a cutback in disability services for soft skills. How do you get along with people? How do you navigate systems? How do you do self-advocacy? It's very hard to get funding for those services. So the Center for Independent Living used to provide a pretty comprehensive housing services program and now it's basically the same list that everybody else gets here call all these places and see if you can find a place there are other organizations that might help out but when you're in the co-op you, when you're coming up on the year that you're going to have to move out for i think most students especially who are looking at financial challenges it's a very difficult time for disabled students it's terrifying and a number of students actually extend their education longer than they would normally just to keep <laughs> in the co-ops, and I'm serious about that. Well, I did that too. We yeah. need a lot of training. For, I mean, I could get more into detail about training, but but the resources are being cut back more and more for yeah. to make that transition. But there's also something to be said about um, uh, planning as far in advance as possible um, because uh, certainly when I moved out uh, I was kind of in a rush and was able to find some place relatively quickly um, that was accessible but I paid a pretty penny for it um, uh, to be able to live there and you know I lived with roommates and um, I was lucky enough to uh, get enough you know get get a good enough job after graduating that I kept my head above water but um, that's not always the case, and I think that people don't realize how long the waiting lists are for affordable housing if they're going to need it. Um, and actually, Alana, I'm not sure, um, you know, it, is it possible for a freshman student uh, to just apply and get, you know, their, their spot in line on those waiting lists and hope that they get to the front of the line when they graduate? Yes, I recently went through this with my niece who is a cat alum who also lived in the co-ops and she lived in Fenwick. And I had to harass her and her mother in the first year to get her on Section 8 waiting lists. And now she is in the MacArthur Commons um, because 
there is no, I, I said, you are either going to have to go back home or get a really good job upon graduating because you can't afford to stay in Berkeley. I mean, and, and so she was able to get on this waiting list, but it, it really varies across the state, county to counties, city to city. There is not a national database that really clearly shows you where you can get on these lists. You have to go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and put yourself on waiting lists. And many of them are not open. Right. I, I can remember it took me years to get an opening on the waiting list. And then it takes years to get to the top of the waiting list. Right. And there are different types of openings. There are building-based. No. Subsidies, yeah. And then there are voucher subsidies that are transferable to any other state after a year. But all the, you're in the weeds immediately. All the details about this type of housing gets really tricky. There are some only for disabled people. There are some only for the seniors. There are some that are only, that are, can be for only seniors, but if it was built before 1965, you can fight your way in as a younger disabled person. Mm -hmm. um, and it does all of this bureaucracy. And it's very hard to find anybody who knows all the rules. Never mind. And they've changed them. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. How did you get housing, Marcella? Well, I have been very lucky all my life, but I do remember that I applied to get on a waiting list when my daughter was small. And so I needed two bedrooms and I got to the top of the waiting list. They offered me a place just as she graduated. Wow. So I didn't need that anymore. I needed, a one, I needed a one bedroom or a studio, which meant I went to the bottom of the list again. Right. It's not a flexible system. It's not a flexible system at all. Right. So okay. these are advocacy things that we'll be needing to do, do for the future to these changes made. Well, something that's happened in Berkeley is that independent living philosophy asks for um, integrated housing. You know, mixed, mixed use, um, mixed age, mixed, mixed status. But the only buildings that we've been able to get done largely for most of the, I believe it was most of the 90s and the aughts, were segregated only for disabled people. Only oh, and that's not good either. It's not only for people with AIDS, only seniors. We're seeing more integrated housing. This no. last, Yes. Okay, I currently live in an integrated housing building, and what they did is there are 100 units, 10 of them maybe for one program, and 10 for another, and 5 for another, and so it's a really fascinating, interesting building. It's a fun building to live in, that if there were 100% of any one kind of person, it would not be that good. Exactly, and those are very rare buildings. Partly because it's impossible mm -hmm. to get federal funding for for that kind of mixed use. I'm using yeah. mixed use as demographics, not as commercial. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have children, we have seniors. It's it's a wonderful building. That's nice. All right, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, do, can you talk about things? Other agencies are doing NGOs, other agencies. Oh, goodness. Um, I can't, I, I think Alana is probably uh, more knowledgeable on, on, on that front than I am. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, so first of all, there's, you know, city commissions that yeah. uh, really are worthwhile for uh, people with disabilities to join. Um, you know, be it the Housing Commission, be it the uh, Design Review uh, Commission and Board, where somebody could advocate for, you know, some more um, accessible units, or the Disability Commission. And actually, um, unfortunately, before I moved to Oakland, we weren't able to pass it, but we did have a draft about improving um, accessibility in new construction in Berkeley. Um, so these are the kind of things where you can draft up um, regulations and legislation and hand it off to the Berkeley City Council and have them pass it. And then boom, all of a sudden, 
you know, 15% of units have roll in showers. Um, like, yeah, like yeah. these are the opportunities for uh, people with disabilities to get involved in. Um, I think there's also uh, a good amount of just simply pro housing groups. Uh, you know, they call themselves YIMBYs. Um, uh, yes, in my backyard, um, kind of a thing. Um, and, uh, they, I don't think that they quite, um, pull in the disability community the way that they do. And I think that, uh, or include people with disability, pull in the disability community. I, my rhetoric here is like, I'm probably offending a bunch of people, but, um, that, uh, you know, the, the disability community, um, isn't really considered as much in these pro housing groups as, as, as possible. Um, and I think that, um, uh, people with disabilities really could help the community by being involved in that and saying like, okay, we know you're pushing for, you know, high rises or, or whatever else push for high rises and then also include accessibility, um, uh, every single time that you do it, uh, you know, use that rhetoric, talk about independent living, um, and, uh, there's something to be said, you know, you were talking about mixed use, um, housing, um, or mixed demographic housing, whatever it might be. But, um, in these larger buildings, if you have a, you know, a, a, a little cork board thing, you know, community board that for people with disabilities, say looking for, um, personal care attendance or something like that, um, having people nearby, um, that then would have a three minute commute from their apartment to your apartment, that's a lot more appealing for a lot of people than, um, you know, uh, IHSS attendants that often because of low pay are priced out of the community and then have to commute in and a short shift simply isn't worthwhile for them. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways for people with disabilities to get involved. Um, I wouldn't, you know, and again, Alana, I think knows more about um, the, the, the actual bureaucratic organizations and the rest than I could say. Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> there, there are a lot of, there, there aren't as many as there used to be, um, and they're very restricted budget-wise. But I'll run down a list of Alameda County resources. And somebody, you know, for those of you who are interested in helping someone find housing outside of the Bay Area, each county has similar resources. You just have to know what to ask for. Um, Right now, if you're in need of emergency housing or, or rental assistance, um, Eden Information and Referral Services is one good resource. There's also the Bay Area Helpline, and they're simply calling 211 that has a lot of county resources. And this has been one of the best things that's happened recently is having someone who's an information and referral specialist that's not specific to disability or other demographic, but who just knows, who has a database of all the stuff in the area. Because you might not, like I've never, only once have I moved into disability specific housing. I've lived in a lot of different places. I had to just learn how to create my own access and create my own community. There's also um, Bay Area Community Services. They have a housing resource center. Um, they primarily work with people with mental health disabilities, but they also do a pretty good cross disability. They have good cross disability awareness around physical access as well. And then there's house, there's Echo Housing that does rental assistance if you need help making um, making a first and last year deposit kind of situation, or you're about to lose your housing because you can't make rent. Um, they also provide um, tenant landlord counseling and negotiation, do home seekings, and, and they really spend a lot of energy on um, home sharing options. So those are the primary resources that are big and broad in Alameda County. Um, and again, every county has a similar set of resources. There are other nonprofits that um, can offer legal advice if you're in a conflict or you're being discriminated against. And again, they're not disability specific. Anybody can usually go to the East Bay Community Law Center and organizations like that. I'm I, I kind of want to touch on one of the reasons why 
being able to stay in say Berkeley or even Oakland um, is so important um, to the disability community. Uh, Alana knows that I've worked on climate change related stuff. And actually that's um, a lot of what I studied when I was in college. And uh, we have a situation where with the housing costs in the Bay Area, people are priced out of, first of all, the areas next to the Bay and the coasts that are cooler, that are more protected from extreme heat events. Um, and people with disabilities are disproportionately susceptible to heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Um, and then um, uh, also priced out into the urban wildland interface where there's a risk of wildfire um, and where it's harder to evacuate and where there's even less transit um, to be able to evacuate in those situations. So we live in a really unique spot um, that if you can afford to live here or find the supports that will help you afford to live here, um, it's actually one of the more climate resilient and climate safe areas um, in California um, in all of California. And uh, so, you know, it's valuable for, for this community here. And if, if I may, um, actually Lily from uh, campus um, had some avenues for um, activism and organization uh, relative to campus specifically. So since we touched on the community a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna share my screen here for just a sec and we can hear from Lily as well on this subject. Uh, final question, question five. What avenues are there for activism and organizing on the access for people with disabilities? As I mentioned uh, previously, I am, I am hired and employed by the Disabled Students Program. And so part of the DSP program, what we're sort of doing to encourage and, and make sure that students do have a community is we have just hired a Disability Cultural Center um, director whose name is Anne. Anne is wonderful and is working on the website. With COVID, there was a little bit of a delay. We anticipated being able to open that cultural center in the fall of 2020, um, but alas, here we are. And so with COVID-19 uh, restrictions and guidelines, UC Berkeley is taking all the precautions necessary, but at the same time, we're also um, moving along with federal gui um, guidelines as, as they're being set. We anticipate that by January, the Disability Cultural Center will be open and available for students. We envision that space to be really a, a space for any student with a disability to come in, to be able to study if needed, to collaborate and work with other students with disability. Uh, I would say that from what students have shared with, with us, the disability activism is really strong and um, it's a community and network where students really talk with each other and really support one another, especially in uh, the process for requesting um, academic accommodations. Another, um, another service that DSP offers is our TRIO program. And so TRIO is a program that students have, well, they don't have to, but if students are interested in TRIO, which is an additional support, uh, there are workshops from budgeting to time management, mm -hmm. um, study skills, uh, disability activism. If students are interested once they are enrolled in DSP, if they're interested in that extra support and that extra uh, individualized planning, um, we do have a learning specialist. And so her name is um, Heather Yaden. Heather is wonderful and is able to meet with students to support anyone with um, uh, their most current concerns. A lot of that would be around uh, time management or discovering and understanding their disability if this is something that is a new identity for students. Um, and so uh, I would say that that's a very, um, another service that we're really proud of in DSP that can provide um, a lot of support for our students while navigating Cal at the same time. Sorry, and then, I don't know that. Sorry about that. And lastly, um, in terms of another service that DSP offers is 
career services for students with disabilities, we do exclusively have a DSP career counselor. And so um, his name is Ricardo Flores and Ricardo is wonderful and is able to support students through obtaining not only employment, but internships and even beyond Cal is really good about connecting with students and checking in. Uh, we really wanna make sure that we are setting our students with disabilities for success through Cal and afterwards. So I think. Wow. You know, I've been, I've been involved in one level or another in being close to someone with a disability for over 50 years. And the one thing that can, seems to be the most recurring thread is adaptability. Everything you, if you really want to get your needs met, you pretty much have to tailor them to yourself. And so the housing, the education system has to be flexible enough so that you can do it for yourself. And that's what I'm hearing from each of you is that certain things need to be in place so that you can take them to the next level. And them to your own needs and not have them so rigid that that you have to just take what somebody else set up for you. I'm just really thrilled that we could have this program together. Our time is running out, but we have we have the site for some time more. I want to continue talking. I thank everybody who participated, everybody who was a guest, and we need to take questions. I didn't see any questions. Are there questions? Or any in the chat. Yeah. I will um, just add if we just want to have it, and especially for everyone who's going to watch this at home um, later. We One thing I wanted to be able to add in too from Lily at UC Berkeley, um, she did um, give us a bit of information about how supportive services um, do fit in. Yes. Um, so anything from caregivers, screen readers, wheelchairs, et cetera. So um, I have a five minutes or so from her on that. So I can play that to close us out. Um, but it, I wanna, you know, before we just put that video on, is there anything that um, Alex or Alana wanna share um, before we sort of put that video in here? One of the most important things I wanna share about what has happened in the disability housing world I watched connected to the campus for now 40 years um, is the pendulum, the policy pendulum keeps swinging. So of course, early in the independent living movement, the focus was on people with physical disabilities. Whether or not they had other more hidden disabilities was largely ignored particularly mental health disabilities, learning disabilities, and other and cognitive impairments. Sensory disabilities and physical disabilities had gotten a lot of attention that has shifted largely. We have a very powerful, active movement of people with neurodiverse, neurodivergent type of disabilities, and that's been amazing. But services for disability, physical disabilities are very expensive, and UC Berkeley, ended its residence program, which allowed students to learn how to live independently, independently, independently in the dorms. And then that was eliminated. Um, there, were, there, were, there were attendants on staff 24 seven, people required to take independent living skills classes to live in the dorms. They learned how to hire their own care providers. That program is gone. And those programs around the country have been eliminated. UC Berkeley really led the charge establishing these things and allowed people with very significant physical disabilities to move away from home out of under the care of their family members and move into these dorms and learn how to do it without their family support. Um, and what happened when that ended the demographics of the people entering a co-op largely changed. Almost everybody who was in the dorm program transitioned into the student co-ops. And now we're not seeing as many physically disabled people 
um, severely disabled people in the at the Center for Independent Living, there are only there are almost never employees who have physical disabilities that require personal test assistant services. Like like I for a long time I was the only person who hired my own attendants when I worked there. And that's a huge change. So the pendulum is swung. We're seeing a lot of great services for people with cognitive disabilities, people with um, intellectual disabilities. They're being supported in their independent living skills and people with mental health disabilities are being able to go to the university like they haven't before. The co-op has really stepped up in accommodating those people. But the, like I said, the pendulum is swung and the pu public policy agenda has also swung. So now we're not seeing as many physically disabled people in the co-op unless they have financial support and we're not seeing it on campus the way we used to. I mean, it's it's like pitting two communities in need against each other for resources that are scarce. And so I'm very sad to see that happen right now. I'm sure Alex should add to that with observations he's made. Well, and, and with the elimination of the DSRP, um, uh, you know, Alana mentioned learning and independent living skills and the rest of it. Uh, for students, new students who weren't already receiving Medi-Cal and in-home supportive services, which pays for attendant care, um, the, the, the DSRP um, helped students fill out that paperwork make sure that their finances were in place, learn how to manage their finances so that they say didn't have more than $2,000 in the bank and get kicked off of these programs, um, et cetera. It, I mean, the asset limits are horrendous, but it, it is what it is. It's a busted system, but you, you live within it. Um, and uh, that disproportionately hits uh, out-of-state students. Because you are more likely as a California resident reaching your 18th birthday to be on Medi-Cal and uh, potentially be on IHSS uh, with, you know, say a family member being your primary um, uh, attendant uh, than you are if you're out of state and Medicaid, you know, here in Medi-Cal is a state by state program. Um, so I moved here from Oregon. Uh, and was in the DSRP, and that buffer of those, you know, 24-hour attendance for that first six months or however much it was, uh, uh, was the the thing that helped me get in and out of bed because I couldn't, you know, pay anybody until I was on in-home supportive services. Um, so yeah, the the elimination of that program. Um, you know, it's really heartbreaking in general, and um, it hits different students disproportionately. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed something similar will, will pop back up. Well, thank you both for participating, um, and thank you for everyone who's been here. I'm going to go ahead and let us hear from Lily. Um, we are over, so if you need to leave, totally understandable. Um, if you don't, then I will be here when the video is over and we can keep talking for a second. So um, thanks everyone. And I'm gonna share my screen so we can hear this next bit about how services fit in at UC Berkeley. And more specifically to answer question two, how do supportive services fit into housing, caregivers, screen readers, wheelchairs, et cetera? I wanna show uh, you today some of our more common accommodations. And so what I'm gonna show you is our accommodations request form. And so this form can be found within our UC Berkeley housing forms section. And the housing accommodations request form, this one is for ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, so ADA requests. And there are instructions at the top, how to submit the form, various ways to do so. In section one, we ask students to just complete some nominal information like their student name, email, cell phone, student ID. 
what the accommodation that they are requesting, the reason for that request. And then at the bottom or in the second page, these are some of our more common uh, or recommended accommodations, but not exclusive. We do have a section for other. And so just to give you an idea of some of the accommodations that we provide for students, if students have mobility impairments, we do have automatic door openers, ADA compliant bathrooms with roll-in showers or shower bench. We have semi-private bathrooms for uh, medical disabilities that would require immediate or more frequent access or more private access into the bathroom. We have modified window openers, lower closet shelves and peepholes, height adjustable desk for wheelchair users, strobe lights, smoke detectors, or fire alarms, visual doorbells. I would say these two accommodations are very common for students who are deaf and hard of hearing, but not exclusive to that community. For any medical or um, gastrointestinal need, we do have the ability to rent more than one microchill per room, meaning that the student, if supported by their documentation and they need their own exclusive microchill, which is our mini fridge, they can submit a request for that. If a student needs kitchen access, room with additional space for medical equipment, a single or a private room, a room with fewer roommates. Um, at the moment, just to give you a little bit more insight of what this means, we do have quadruple uh, occupancy, be occupancy bedrooms, triple occupancy bedrooms, double occupancy bedrooms, and singles. If it's a disability need, we also have placement with a requested roommate as an ADA accommodation. Um, ground floor room or a room on a lower floor if this is a disability need, location close to the Tang Medical Center, which is our hospital, location close to campus. I would say this is usually paired with uh, information regarding what side of campus. We have the north side or we do have some um, on-campus housing that is, is just as close to campus as the south side. Uh, room removed from traffic noise and other exterior distractions. This is very common for students who really don't want to be living close to Telegraph Street or any other loud, um, busy area. Room with less allergens, room without carpet for severe respiratory concerns. We do have a few uh, carpet-free assignments, as well as a building called Blackwell, where um, all of the housing assignments in there are carpet-free. If, you know, student requires their own mattress uh, due to disability, that is an accommodation. Removal of furniture is not allowed except for the ADA needs. If a student needs to replace their twin mattress with a double XL twin mattress, we do allow that. And this is also for any student who's above six feet tall, um, ADA or not. If a student is requesting a service or emotional animal, we have that available. Substance-free environment as an ADA need and internet slash network connectivity for disability related devices. I think this goes into um, the question and two. So I'll go back to the presentation here. And so whatever the student needs or requires, we're willing to work with students. We do have a lot of students with mobility impairments in wheelchairs. We have students who have um, attendants and or caregivers. And we wanna make sure that all of our students are able to access our housing and live and enjoy just as equally as any other student. Wonderful. So that's a bit of a summary um, uh, for what you see Berkeley um, does insofar as accommodations are concerned. Um, for everyone who's watching or listening to this and who's been here, um, we will share this recording as well as um, a list of links and these slides so that um, for um, people who are interested in delving a little bit further into what we've discussed today or reaching out to any of those resources or organizations that you can do so. Um, please also let us know if you would like a transcription of this. I'll include a note on that in the email that goes out, but we're welcome. We're, uh, we're happy to provide that as well too, um, since we didn't have closed captionings. Um, all right, so thank you so much, everyone. Um, I see we've got a chat. 
A fun comment from Mary Ann. The pendulum in the 70s were dynamic, exciting times, running support for the 504 sit-in and SF, the first time reasonable accommodation was yeah. codified. Lifeguarding for Berkeley Outreach Rec Program, ORP, zipping around campus in a golf cart, working on equal access to transportation. They appreciate the updates on the current housing situation. Thanks for the session. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really uh, lovely to share this time with you. And if anyone has questions, you can always reach out to the BSCAA. Um, again, I'm Annalise, our president, and um, you can go to bscaa.coop um, and our contact info is on there and uh, we'd love to connect. So thank you everyone. And I hope you have a lovely weekend. And I think because it's homecoming, I probably have to say, go bears. Go bears. Go bears, beat the cougars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, take care.